Shalom, brothers and sisters. Let's talk Israel. Let's catch up with all of us holding our breath and watching and praying for the inevitable mass attack from multiple fronts that's coming from Iran. But let's look at the latest news coming out of there and just talk about some of them. The first one, Temple Mount Sheik, who mourned Hamas chief could lose his Israeli residency. Now, absolutely. This is common sense. I mean, why is this even a discussion? He should have been turfed out of the country a while ago. And yes, strong opinion. I stand by that. And we'll get into it. Israeli Interior Minister Moshe Arbel said Friday that he intends to revoke the residency permit of a sheikh who publicly mourned the death of Ishmael Haniye in a sermon earlier that day at the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount. For many years, Sabri, the sheikh, has been inciting against the state, encouraging anti-Semitism and terrorism, and committing security offenses. Among other things, Sabri has published anti-Semitic literature for years, serves as a senior member of an organization that transfers donations to Hamas, supports suicide attacks and praises the murder of Israelis. Hence my point. Why is this man still in Israel? Why have they not rolled up, picked him up, dumped him in a van and tossed him outside the country by someone else's border? He should be gone doing all these things and still being allowed in your country. And then they say Israel is too strict or too militant and anti everyone and trying to get rid of everyone. But someone like this has managed to do these things and still live there and be a resident for how long now? How many years? And then we're not even talking about the Palestinian Authority and how they still pay for slay all this time and they live in Israel. It's absolutely sick and twisted. And I think they should draw a line in the sand now and say, you know what, enough. You want to hate us and murder us and kill us and dedicate education to telling people that we are monsters and need to be wiped out, then cheers. Take your sandwich and go. You're not welcome in this country. That's what they should be doing. Absolutely. Dismantling Hamas from within, IDF uncovers a trove of Hamas secrets. IDF and Shin Bet uncovered extensive Hamas intelligence, revealing lists of suspected LGBTQ plus individuals, brutal tactics, global operations, and systematic terror attacks. So all of those gays for Palestine and all those people, they have lists about who might be LGBTQ in the area. Why? So they can throw them off buildings and finish the problem. That is how they handle it. So remember that next time you're having a rally for gays for Palestine or LGBTQ plus pro for Palestine and all that rubbish. A phrase book of Hebrew words, obviously that we've seen this before, was discovered in this place, helping terrorists communicate in Hebrew, including phrases such as take off your clothes. Among the findings, operational tables, equipment lists, classified maps, instructions on what to do if captured, leading to the conclusion that Hamas military wing has transformed into a professional army right under Israel's nose. Now they say this is the shocking realization they have. These people have been trained to the point, probably by Russia and Iran and all these people, of being an actual army, not just a ragtag bunch of people that are angry and hateful, but a military army. The amount of intelligence accumulated so far in the hands of Shin Bet and military intelligence allows us to dismantle Hamas from within said a senior security official exposed to the heaps of documents. So it's a win for them. But I think it's also a very sobering realization that they're not just fighting a bunch of crazy, mad extremists, but they're fighting a military army organized, you know, with training. That's what they're fighting. And that's why it's been so difficult to this point. Netanyahu says Israel will strike in Beirut, Yemen, wherever necessary. They don't mean strike with little placards saying we are Jews, like it or not. They mean strike with weapons. If you pick a fight, you're going to find one. That's what he's saying. 
Jordanian foreign minister makes a rare visit to Tehran while the U.S. readies to defend the Jewish state. Israel will stand firm against any threat by Iran and its proxies near and far, including Beirut and Yemen, said Netanyahu. Uh, Yoav Gallant also iterated this on Sunday as the international community scrambled to prevent an all-out Iranian-Israeli war. Can't prevent it, it's coming. Whoever seeks to harm us will pay a heavy price, Netanyahu said. Our readiness in terms of defense is high, be it on the ground or in the air, Gallant stated. Our long hand strikes in the Gaza Strip, in Yemen, in Beirut, wherever necessary, Netanyahu stressed. This is our hand that will reach out when the time comes for peace to whoever wants to establish peaceful relations with us. I believe it will be so, because peace is made with the strong, not with the weak, he stated. Now, the interesting thing for me here is, besides the threat and the reminder, because they've been doing this for many, many years, you hit us, we'll hit you back really hard. And there's lots of examples I can give you on this. But besides saying and reiterating that message, come, we will hit you right back if you hit us. Be assured of that no matter what happens. You hit us hard, we're going to hit you back even harder. That's their philosophy. But then he ends it with a very big focus on peace. And peace is made with the strong. So that is also a beautiful setup for me, sitting from a biblical prophetic point of view and knowing that we're approaching a time frame, a final week of Jacob's trouble, of a seven-year treaty uh, agreement, a covenant with hell and with death that will be signed and that peace will be offered to them from the strong to the strong to make sure that everything is fine, a strengthening of an agreement as mentioned in Daniel. So we're seeing that groundwork being laid in conversations, in speeches, in messages like these. Hezbollah reportedly evacuates command center from South Beirut. The Shiite jihadists of Hezbollah started evacuating headquarters and military equipment from the Dahia district in Beirut amidst fears of escalating war with Israel, according to Arabic media last Friday. The reports claimed the terror militia advised residents living in buildings housing senior terror chiefs, as well as those in nearby buildings, to relocate to safer locales. They know this thing is an unstoppable train and it's coming and they're preparing forthwith and they're seeing the longer they wait, more commanders are getting taken out by Israel one after the other. So it's only a matter of time. Washington dispatched additional aircraft carrier and fighter jets to the Middle East to counter Iran-led threats against Israel. The USS Abraham Lincoln and its carrier strike group were ordered to leave the Pacific to replace the USS Theodore Roosevelt carrier strike group, according to the statement from the Pentagon uh, and the press secretary, Sabrina Singh. In addition, the Pentagon will send another squadron of F-22 fighter jets, an unspecified number of additional Navy cruisers and destroyers capable of intercepting ballistic missiles and is preparing to send more land-based ballistic missile defense systems if the need arises. It's almost overkill for me. I mean, if you don't understand this or know this, Google it, look it up, speak to someone who does. A carrier strike group from the United States is a formidable, formidable force. That in itself is already overkill. It has the ability to wage a war on its own. Okay, facts. I'm not just singing America's praises or anything. Go and look into what comprises a carrier group. To send that entire group and extra F-22 squadrons and extra marines and extra ships, it, it's almost like you're not just preparing to defend that airspace against the incoming onslaught of the axis of evil against Israel, but you're preparing for something to do with Ukraine maybe and the European escalating breakdown and the impending threat of Russia and China in that area too. That you're preparing for a bigger World War III initiative that is very nearly boiling over into various places. That for me <clears throat> makes more sense 
with what I see in the mobilization of these military assets in the region. U.S. forces destroy multiple Houthi weapons and vehicles in the past 24 hours. CENTCOM announced on Monday American forces recently destroyed three uncrewed aerial systems belonging to the Houthis. The drones were launched from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen over the Gulf of Aden. The weapons were all destroyed between Sunday evening and Monday evening. CENTCOM added that U.S. forces also destroyed three other weapons and vessels belonging to the Houthis. All of this in the last 24 hours and then the war and the, the full onslaught hasn't even kicked off yet. This is just the simmering edges of what is to come. Iran has warned pilots to avoid airspace as the Middle East awaits the coming attack. The country called a gathering of foreign diplomats in Tehran, where acting foreign minister Ali Bagheri Khani criticized what he termed as U.S. and European complicity in supporting Israel. Such aggression cannot go unanswered, Bagheri Khani stated on social media following the meeting. The Islamic Republic's response will be definitive and decisive. According to a U.S. official who spoke with the journal, Iran issued a notice to pilots and aviation authorities warning of potential disruptions to GPS and navigational signals. The warning posted on the website of the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration echoes a similar notice issued by Iran on April the 13th, the day it launched its direct military attack on Israel. However, Iran denied reports of issuing such a notice and its airspace appeared to remain operational as of Monday afternoon with regional flights continuing as usual. So what do I think of that? I think, yes, it was quite possible that they let their friends know watch the airspace and and be careful with your flying and your pilots because this is going to go down at a moment's notice i also think that they're waiting for two reasons and and the one is more obvious than the other so the less obvious one would be that they're waiting till everybody goes okay nothing's going to happen it was a false alarm and they get back to their normal everyday lives and then they attack when least expected they don't want the whole world to be ready and waiting. They want everyone to think, oh, false alarm. Don't worry. It's all cool. Everyone's calmed down. Tempers are gone now. That's what I think is waiting. The second more obvious one is that they cleverly are waiting for the ninth of Av. We've entered the month of Av. It's a hectic month for the Jews. Go watch my video. I'll repost the link for you on the community wall. Um, getting to the history of that, it's the time of the destruction of both temples <clears throat> on the 9th of Av, which is really interesting. So it would make a lot of sense that the 9th of Av, and of course there's historic um, evidence to point to the fact of the whole Haman story, which links to Persia, which links to Iran, that ties into the 9th of Av as well. But the 9th of Av, a, a day of mourning and a day of really reflecting on what they've lost and bad things that have happened would be the perfect time to attack the Jews in Israel on a psychological level, not just a military level, that that is when they will strike. So I don't think anything will happen between now and the 9th of Av. I could be completely wrong. We didn't all see October 7 happening on October 6. Business as usual, watching the world as usual, praying for Israel as usual. October 7, shock and horror. So I could very well be wrong, absolutely, admit that happily. But I would lean towards, I don't think there's an attack coming before the 9th of Av for both those reasons. Reason number one, by then the rest of the world that's not focused on the history of the 9th of Av or anything like that will think false alarm, nothing major is going to happen, relax look elsewhere, bam, attack comes. Or the 9th of Av, and then that attack comes. Be assured, Israel is definitely aware of the possibility of a 9th of Av attack. And from religious circles and the far right religious, they absolutely expect that to happen as part of a punishment or a reminder that they need to repent and draw closer to God. 
So 9th of Av would be a big watch for Israel and a high prayer time for Israel as well. But um, yeah, keep your eyes on God's prophetic clock. Israel, keep watching, keep praying for them. Keep praying for their hearts of stone to turn to flesh, for scales to fall from their eyes and for more and more of them to be part of this initial Harpazo rapture event and be taken away before the time of Jacob's trouble. Every single one that turns to the Lord now has escaped a horrifying time in the history of Israel. A time through which only one third will make it out on the other side of the time of Jacob's trouble. God bless. Keep looking up. Shalom.